Hello, I'm Juhi and I take great pleasure in welcoming you today to this course on Introduction to Film Studies. Now, this video lecture today marks the beginning of the course. Uh, now, before we delve into the nitty gritties of film theory and film studies, it is pertinent that we first discuss what are the various constituents of cinema, what are the various visual elements and oral elements that come together to create this beautiful, wonderful world of cinema that we all so much love. We will be doing exactly that in the coming two weeks. Now, just to give you a basic idea about what Unit 1 is all about. So, Unit 1 constitutes of eight, uh, it, it, it constitutes a series of eight video lectures. Uh, four video lectures will be done in week 1 and, four, and the remaining four video lectures will be completed in week 2. Now, before we begin, let me give you an introduction as to what we will be talking about in Unit 1, which is called Language of Cinema. Now, as mentioned, in this unit, we will be talking about the language of cinema, its grammar and its syntax. Now, you might be wondering, how is it that cinema has a language? Well, hold on to that thought. We'll be talking about it just in a little while. We'll also be talking about the very basic of visuals in cinema. How is it that visuals in a film are developed, are conceived and brought into life on your screens? We'll also be talking about uh, the concept of editing. Now, as you might be aware, some of you, of course, uh, cinema in the early times was completely uh, shot from one single angle. There were hardly a, uh, one minute long clips. So, we'll talk about how editing came into cinema and the consequent impact it had on storytelling. Next, we'll also talk about sound. How was sound introduced into cinema and how it impacted uh, the cinema as we see it today. Finally, we will talk about the history of cinema. We will be tracing the history of cinema from the early era all to the time when uh, the studio system was developed in Hollywood. We will also be talking about the consequent developments, but in detail in the coming uh, uh, weeks. Uh, as for today, uh, let me give you a brief idea about what we are going to, going to do today. Today we will be concentrating solely on the visual language of cinema. Uh, we will be talking about cinematography, a very important tool with any cinematographer or any director. So, what is cinematography? What does it entail? We will be answering all those questions. We will also then talk about the very famous five C's of cinematography as outlined by Joseph Meskelly, a very acclaimed and renowned cinematographer of his times. Finally, we will talk about the concept of the visual universe. So, any film that you watch, it's set, it is set in its own universe. How is it that this kind of a universe is created? What does this concept of the visual universe encompass? and how do you sustain it throughout the entire film. So, these are the various things that we will be talking about today. Now, uh, what, are the what are the objectives of this particular uh, lecture today? So, by the end of this lecture, you should have gained an understanding about the concept of the language of cinema. Uh, you would have become aware of the various, uh, of the different or the rich vocabulary that is available to a filmmaker. You would have become aware of the grammar and syntax of cinema, about various compositional principles that govern a frame uh, and also allow a director to convey meaning and create text and subtext visually. Now, first, uh, what is meant by the language of cinema? Language of cinema uh, is nothing. Now, as you might know, cinema is a, tools, uh, is a tool for communication. Why? Because it is through cinema that people all over the world are become aware of a lot of new uh, issues. Peop like, uh, for example, if someone in uh, someone sitting in, let's say, UK, is watching a film uh, made in India, so a, a film made in India will of course have a lot of concepts that are very uh, local or that are uh, that are that are true only to India. So someone when watches that particular film sitting in UK, he or she becomes aware of what it is that India might be about. So therefore, cinema is a tool of communication. Now, any tool of communication, as you might know, uh, let's take the example of uh, English. English is a language, right? Uh, it has 26 alphabets. But then, how we combine these various alphabets together to form words and then these words to form sentences. Uh, this is what we do with our language. Now, the same concept applies to cinema as well. So, cinema is a tool that the director uses to communicate with the audience. So, the earliest film, as I just mentioned, were nothing but just uh, recordings of some events that had happened in real life. They were also known as actualities. 
if we talk about films that we see today, majorly a lot of films are fiction films. And these uh, films communicate stories. And therefore, because uh, cinema is a, media, is, is, ha is a means of communication, it automatically has a language of its own. Now, this language of cinema has developed over more than hundreds of years. So, we'll try to talk about what it is and how is it that this language uh, is, uh, is learned or how is this language put, uh, language put to use to tell a story. So, as I said, cinema does have a language of its own. So, all the different shots, the colors, the camera movements, the kind of sound that is used, the music, these all can be said to be the alphabets of cinema. And how is it that these alphabets are put together? How is it that these various elements are put together? The kind of guidelines that govern the use of uh, these various elements to tell a story, they can be said to be the grammar or the syntax of cinema. We'll talk about them. You might also be aware of certain conventions, both, both regional as well as global. Now, what are these conventions that I'm talking about? Conventions are nothing but uh, the various uh, minute things that you have been able to observe throughout your viewings of the different kinds of films. So, something like if you want to, if you want to show the passage of time, you would see that the sun is slowly going into a fade out situation. This automatically would communicate to the audience that the day is coming to an end or something new is going to begin. Uh, another example would be, uh, which is very typical to Indian cinema, that you see a young boy who is running, you see a close up of his feet, he's running and as he's running in that motion itself, the boy grows into an adult. Next, we'll be looking at two clips that are kind of two conventions from Indian cinema. Now, the two examples that you just saw are, as I said, conventions. So, you all know the moment the camera pans that the boy is going to grow up into an adult. Or, as in the second example, you have a close-up of the feet and the next shot you see that the boy has all grown up. Now, let us talk about cinematography. I'm sure you have heard that term before. Now, what does, what does this term mean? It actually comes from a Greek word and it means writing with motion. Now, the key term here is the term motion because it is the moving images that make cinema different from photography. Of course, as uh, you, mu you must be aware, uh, cinema comes after photography. Photography was still images. Cinema is moving images, which is why, you know, people accepted it, people loved it so much. Anyway, moving back to cinematography. It is important that we understand that cinematography is not just about picking up the camera, pointing it at an event and recording it. It is much more than that. It requires a great amount of planning on account of the director or the director uh, of photography or cinematographer, where they take ideas, abstract ideas in fact, that are in the human mind or that are perhaps on a piece of paper. And these ideas are then converted into to visuals, visuals that uh, convey emotions or values or various tones uh, and various other forms of intangible or non-verbal forms of communication that happen. So, it's very important that you understand cinematography is not just a term. It's not just about, you know, picking up the camera and shooting. It refers to any and any, uh, any and every visual element in a film. So, anything that you see on your frame in a film has been there uh, pre-planned and is part of the cinematography. Um, at the heart of it, cinematography is a creative and a highly technical skill too creative because you have to be able to use all the visual elements available to you to tell your story and technical because you need to know exactly how to work with your equipment to be able to tell that story. There are a range of methods and techniques that are used to add layers and layers of meaning. So, any cinema is not just about the story. It always has different layers of meaning uh, that can be talking about the society and so all these different techniques that are used uh, they are used to add meaning as well as subtext to any film. Uh, together, if we club all these various techniques, we can simply call them cinematic techniques. Let us begin by discussing the smallest unit of a film. Now, what is it? A very tiny single frame. Now, to give you an idea, 
a, f a single photograph that you click is one frame. Now, why is this frame so important? Because cinema, as I said, is moving images. How are these moving images created? Uh, imagine something like a flip book. There are various single individual drawings that are drawn on a piece of paper and they are very rapidly flicked. And when they are flicked rapidly, it appears the entire uh, uh, drawings, they appear to be in motion. The same concept applies to cinema as well. One frame is there, but there are lots of frames that come together that are uh, shown to you on your television screen or, or, or in the cinema hall in rapid succession. And that is how you get the illusion of motion taking place. And therefore, it becomes very important for us to understand why or how is the frame constructed, what happens in a frame. Now, very simply, uh, a frame conveys visual information. Now, this information is something that the director has put in deliberately. So, nothing in a frame is unintentional. Now, the next time you go and watch any film, you should pay careful attention to every element that you see on your frame. Because everything that you see on the frame, as I said, has been deliberately put in by the director or the cinematographer. Now, this information that you see, uh, uh, this, all the visual elements that you see, they are put in because the director intends a very specific message to be communicated to the audience. So, what does the director do? The director, through all these various uh, visual elements, through all the grammar and syntax of cinema, he or she directs the gaze of the audience or directs the attention of the audience to very specific events or to very specific objects or persons so that the, the director, so that the audience can look at what the director wants them to. Now, of course, as we discussed the various cinematic tools that are used, the director does uh, this through using these cinematic tools. Now, please be very, very conscious when you look at, uh, when you watch the other film, because you'll realize that the director actually tells you where to look, what to look at, and also in what order. So, all these things the director is able to communicate in one single frame. So, a, min a frame is able to communicate meaning or mood or tone and uh, or atmosphere and also the subtext of a film. And that's how important the frame is. Now, this frame that you're looking at is from a Gurudat film called Kagas Ke Pool. Now, if you look at this frame, I'm sure you're getting some kind of information. Of course, there is the uh, look on the act actress's face. But it's also about the kind of lighting. If you look at the lighting, it does convey some meaning to you. Uh, you can see a lot of pregnancy in the face. And this is what I mean. It's a single frame. It's a grab from a film. But yet, it is able to communicate to you at so many different levels. For a director, uh, a frame is basically a compositional choice that is exercised uh, by him or her to tell you exactly what to look at. So, the, the director chooses uh, and selects and emphasizes what various visual elements should be focused and brought to the attention of the viewer. So, various visual compositional principles come together and work in a single frame to bring what you see uh, in front of you. Now is the time to discuss the five C's of cinematography. Now, as I'd mentioned, the five C's of cinematography are these uh, five concepts that are very, very essential to cinematography and have been outlined by Joseph Meskeli. Joseph Meskeli was a very acclaimed cinematographer. He shot various documentaries and films during World War II and then, of course, he moved on to shooting fiction films also. So, this film, of course, has been, uh, has, been in the, has been in publication for more than 50 years now. But even today, uh, this book is a go-to book for a student of film studies or also for a person who wants to practice cinematography. Uh, the five C's, as outlined by uh, Joseph Meskeli, are camera angles, continuity, cutting, close-ups and composition. Now, let's delve a little deeper into what these five C's are and what do they constitute, what do they talk about. First and foremost, we have camera angles. Now, what is a camera angle? Very simply, it refers to the position of the camera vis-a-vis -vis the subject. So, if I am the, uh, if I am the subject, where will the, camera be positioned, where will the camera be positioned with regards to me? So, will the camera be here in front of me or will the camera be here on top or will the camera probably be on the side? So, all these different positions that you see are known as camera angles and they make a very marked difference in the kind of perception that the audience will have. So, I will show you examples later on and you will see how uh, camera angles can actually make a difference uh, in the kind of message that the audience is able to take away. So, 
while talking about camera angles mescali talks about image size and image angle image size is something that we'll talk about in more detail later but this one uh, right now we'll concentrate on image angle or as i said image uh, uh, your camera angle now what does it do it determines the viewpoint for the audience now you have to remember that the camera always takes the place of the audience so whatever the camera is viewing sort of becomes the viewpoint of the audience also so this is something that as a director the director keeps in mind there is a huge range of camera angles that is available to a, a director but which one to choose will depend on the kind of message or the kind of emotion the director wants to uh, develop or the director wants as a response from the audience now while discussing camera angles mescali stresses that the uh, use of varied and relevant camera angles is very important because it makes the story very impactful so imagine shooting one film or imagine watching a film not shooting if you watch a film where the entire film is shot from one camera angle you know you might not realize it but what happens is that the audience becomes bored so in order to in order to make your story impactful it is important as mescali stresses to have different and varied kinds of camera angles in your film now what you see on screen right now of course is the very famous villain in bollywood mogambo but look at the camera angle that you see this kind of a camera angle is known as a low angle shot what does it do it makes the uh, subject appear larger than life and let me also tell you that this is the first time mogambo appears on screen in the film so the very first impact for the audience without them realizing of course subconsciously is that they think of mogambo as a very powerful a uh, uh, subject as a very powerful uh, villain right so this is how the character of mogambo is also built upon not by saying anything but just by a single camera angle now let us move on to the second c of cinematography as talked about by uh, joseph mescali which is continuity now continuity is uh, a very simple concept actually it might seem difficult but very simply what it means is that whenever you're telling a story the story should appear very smooth very continuous and it should have a logical flow there should be no haphazardness to a story so to make it simpler even i would say that continuity is all about making sure that your events in the story flow in a chronological order so there's a beginning a middle and an end now how how can this continuity be achieved a very simple rule will be that you try to keep the images as close to reality or as close to real life uh action as possible now all these things are said by joseph mescali so this is advice from joseph mescali for someone who wants to study or someone who wants to practice cinematography another thing that joseph mescali mentions is that nothing in the frame should distract the viewer so what happens is that uh anything that you're composing in your frame you should make sure that there is no element in your composition that calls attention to itself when it shouldn't because what happens then is that it breaks the illusion of this universe of the film that you've created and automatically the continuity breaks so continuity of watching the film continuity of experiencing the film breaks now joseph mescali stresses on the on the concept of cinematic time and cinematic space now what is cinematic time and cinematic space very simply in a story now you might have watched bollywood films uh, sometimes they are uh, they are of a story that is that probably stretches 20 years long sometimes it might be of a story that stretches two days so that is cinematic time you have to make sure you know when uh, when a story is being told that there is a continuity of time that something that was in the past is not uh, told before or that something is going to happen later is not told to the audience before that is what is meant by cinematic time moving on to cinematic space cinematic space again is very simple like right now i'm sitting in this uh, uh, in desk right so this comprises my space at any point of time i have to make sure uh, or, or you know or not me of course the uh, the director has to make sure that if there is a cut between me and the next uh, op, uh, and the next uh, shot there should not be a change in the scene for example like this mouse that you see here it's here in this frame right now but if in the next shot you were to come back and this mouse was not there you might probably not realize it but what has happened is that one of the components in the scene have gone missing so this is known as a continuity break so this is something that uh, is being stressed upon mescali refers to continuity as purely common sense uh, in coordinated action so if you use your common sense while shooting you will make sure that continuity is maintained and it's a very important concept that should be kept in mind while shooting this is all advised by mescali
Let us move on to the next uh, C as described by Joseph Meskelly. The next concept in the five C's of cinematography is close ups. Now, what is close ups? Uh, very simple close up is a very uh, tight shot or a very tight framing of any object. Now, here specifically, we are going to talk about close up with reference to the human face. And I will also show you a clip, I will also show you some screenshots. Now, in this, uh, when, when uh, uh, Joseph Meskelly stresses about the importance of the uh, of this shot size, which is the close up and the different varieties that it has. Now, it is important we understand that close up as a shot size is something that is unique to the film medium. Why is it so? Because before film there was, there were plays that people would go to, people would go to theatres and ballets and opera, but there the audience would be fixed with regards to the uh, theatre. So, there would be no movement. Whatever the acting was happening, whatever uh, event or whatever action was happening on stage would be visible to the audience from a fixed angle. They would, they could not go closer to the people to have a closer look or a better look. So, therefore, this particular uh, uh, concept or this particular tool, the close-up tool becomes very, very unique to cinema. And it is important that uh, as a director, he or she learns to use it in a very specific way. What does a close-up do? It is useful in isolating and bringing narrative emphasis to all the significant events or actions that are, that are taking place in a frame. It can also be used to eliminate anything that is not required or anything that does not require the attention of the audience. So, therefore, when you have a close up, you are eliminating everything that is not required. You are eliminating all the information that is unwanted. Uh, close ups are also used to provide some kind of a dramatic impact and also visual clarity. So, uh, if you can think of examples, uh, a very tight close up of an eye or a hand, what it does is, is that it brings a lot of clarity to the audience about what is it that they are looking at. Uh, another thing that a close up does is that it increases the involvement of the audience in the film. Because imagine looking, uh, imagine watching a film where everything you see has been shot, where the actors or where the characters are not visible, they are very far away from you. You would eventually lose interest because you are not getting the details. Therefore, what the close up does is that it builds on that connection, it makes the audience involved in the film more and more. And therefore, uh, this makes the close up a very effective story, uh, story uh, telling tool. Now, what you are seeing on screen right now again is from the same film, uh, Mr. India, the 1987 film. Now, what you see, this is what is known as a close up. Now, why is it, why is this close up important or what is the close up doing here? What it is doing is that it is showing you a person with his or her hand, with his hand, sorry, with his hand on the globe. What does it tell you about the character? Even before you come to know who he is, even before you come to know what kind of a person he is, you can guess from this single close up that this person is someone who wants to dominate the world or someone who is in a very strong is, is in a position of strong power right and this kind of a close up is able to bring emphasis to this particular uh, to this particular action now let's move on to the uh, next component in the five c's of cinematography what is composition it is nothing but an arrangement of pictorial elements to form a unified or harmonious whole in the words of Joseph Meskelly. Now, composition again uh, talks about or deals with how your different elements that are in a frame are put together with regards to each other. Now, at any point of time, the composition should be should be done in such a way that it, uh, it garners a very favourable uh, reaction from the audience. Now, when I say favourable, it does not mean that the audience likes the film or it says, oh yes, this is a wonderful frame. No. What it means is that the audience is able to react in exactly the same way that the director wants to, you know, as per the story, as the story is flowing. Uh, next, we have uh, the fact that with a composition, the pictorial impact or the psychological impact uh, is very, very uh, specific. So, what it does is that whenever you have a composition, uh, your audience has a very specific response to it. The director has to be aware of how to play on the psychology of the audience and this is what, uh, this is where, this is why composition becomes a very important element. One of the advice that Joseph Meskelly gives when he's talking about composition is that keep it simple. Now, keep it simple doesn't mean that you have very few elements and just frame them in a very simple manner, no. By keep it simple, Meskelly means uh, that you should be able to stick to what the story wants to tell. Do not want to, do not 
bring in a lot of other references or do not uh, over complicate your material. Uh, only frame material in your composition that is desirable or that you think is uh, required to tell the story. We will be watching a clip from the film Mr. India. We have looked at two screenshots and uh, let us have a look and try to see whether we have understood these five C's that we have just talked about, you know, the five C's of cinematography and how are they used in this particular uh, scene that we will see. Now, the scene that we just saw, it is a very famous dialogue of course, all of you must be aware of it. Now, if you look at all the components, how are they, how do they uh, come to play in this particular film? Close up, uh, we have talked about, I also showed you the camera angle. Now, in terms of composition, the composition throughout the, if, if you look at it carefully, you can watch it again. If you look at the composition, the composition throughout is maintained in such a way that nothing in the frame is uh, something that is unwanted. It's, it makes sure that uh, the meaning of the of this particular shot, which is to talk about the dominance of Mogambo or, or, or to talk about the character of Mogambo is able to be taught to the audience, is able to be brought forward to the audience, right. So, uh, the other thing that we, uh, uh, the other thing that we should be talking about is cutting. Now, what is cutting? As, as I just mentioned, cutting is all about editing. So, how is this entire scene edited? It is edited in such a way that the entire action seems completely normal. By normal, I mean there are no jerks. Uh, you do not feel uh, when, uh, when, when uh, the shot is uh, cutting from one to the other, you know, you have this very wide shot of the place. It establishes the entire place and then you also have close ups. Now, throughout this entire clip, at any point of time, you do not feel that, you know, uh, uh, there is a trouble or there is some kind of a jerk. So, that is what cutting and continuity together mean. Now, we had just uh, discussed uh, in one of the five C's the term close up. Now, I had briefly mentioned that a close up means uh, a short size and I also said that there are various short sizes that are available to a director. Now, what are these uh, short sizes? These are the extreme long shot or the ELS, the LS or the long shot the MLS or the mid long shot, MS mid shot, MCU mid close up, CU close up and finally, ECU which is extreme close up. Now, we will talk about what is the relevance of these short sizes and when are they, sh when are they used, what is it that the director is wanting to communicate when these short sizes are used. So, first up we have the extreme long shot. As I have already mentioned, ELS is known as the extreme long shot or the extreme wide shot. Now, very simply, it is a very wide shot of any setting. What is it used for? It is used to establish the location. It is used to establish the place where the action of a particular scene or a particular film is taking place. So, you can think of again, think of all the films that you watched and you will realize that majorly whenever something new is happening or a scene changes, generally it is this very wide shot where you can see a lot of uh, space, uh, a lot of uh, uh, the setting. The humans as such are not clearly visible. When, when I say humans, I mean the human figure. The character is not clearly visible. And what this extreme long shot does is that it establishes the location for you. It tells the audience that this is the place where the action is going to take place. Generally, it is used in the beginning of a film or as I said, in the beginning of a new scene. Now, I will show you an example of what an extreme long shot might look like. These are screenshots from two different films. This is from the good, the bad, the ugly, an extreme long shot as you can see, you cannot see the human figure. Similarly, this uh, one here, now I've, uh, this one here is again an example of an extreme long shot from the film Star Wars. Uh, it establishes for you that this particular film is not just about, it is not just based in some city on earth, but it is probably about intergalactic uh, narrative. 
Let's move on to the next short size. Now, this next short size is known as the LS or the long shot or the wide shot. Now, typically what happens is in this long shot is that you can see the full body of the character. So, it's a little closer than the extreme long shot, but it still gives you a good sense of the environment that this particular character is in. So, what it does is that it shows the audience and it places the character in context of the surroundings. So, right now, uh, if, uh, if uh, an, a long shot of this particular setting where I'm sitting right now was to be shot, the camera would go further away from me and you would be able to see more of what is visible to you right now. You will be able to see more space both to the left and right of me and that would become a long shot. And of course, uh, probably you're able to see a little more detail right now. You will be able, you will not be able to see as much detail about me in a long shot. Uh, what does a long shot do? It orients the audience to the relationship between the character and the place. So, how is it that the character is related to that particular place, to that particular setting that he or she is in? Now, this particular shot can be both exterior shot or an interior shot. Now, as I said, if let's say you have a shot of a person in the beach, so you can have a long shot where you have where you can see the full human figure and you can see the entire beach. So it tells you that the person is there, you know, for a reason, probably to enjoy a day out and all of that. Let's look at an example of long shots. This example is from the good, the bad, the ugly, and you can see, you know, far into the frame that there's a person, the full uh, figure is visible. Now, this shot comprises as a long shot, and uh, it tells you probably that this person appears to be some kind of an outsider with the way he is fixed just at the entrance. The next example, again, is from uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens. Here again, you can see the entire figure of Rey, and this is just after Rey has helped BB-8 out again and it tells you how, if you look at it, you can see the entire frame that the characters are in. Now, the next shot that we will talk about is the mid-long shot. What does the mid-long shot do? Now, you, th you must realize that we are moving from the widest shot to the closer and tighter shot compositions. So, now we have the mid-long shot. Now, what does the mid-long shot do? Very simply, uh, it basically uh, captures the human figure from the head to just below the knee. So, again, now what, ha what has happened is that you have uh, come a little more closer to the character. This shot is also known as a cow cowboy shot because this kind of a shot composition was first used in the Western films. Now, when I say Western films, I do not mean films that are made in the West, but Western films such as the ones that I've been showing you examples of, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, or something like what uh, the, our uh, Indian film Shole uh, was uh, inspired from. So, that this kind of a shot is also known as a cowboy shot because uh, you are able to see uh, the entire uh, figure as well as the gun that is hanging at the side of the cowboy. When you are moving this close to the subject, to the character, what it does is that it gives you a little more detail about the costume. The gestures or the movements of the character become a little more visible, they become a little more clear to you, right? And you start losing out information in terms of the surroundings. Uh, this kind of a shot is used to show interaction between characters. So, you might have two, three characters. Whenever you have this kind of a setting, uh, you have a mid-long shot composition. Uh, what it does is, as, as I had already said, it's bringing the audience a little more closer to the audience. So, all these reasons are why the character, why a director might use this kind of a shot in his or her composition. Now, let's look at examples of the mid-long shot. So, this again, uh, from the good, the bad, the ugly, you can see that it's a mid-long shot. It's cut just below the knee and it tells you, it sort of tells you about the relationship between the two characters that you see on screen. Next, we have the shot from the, uh, from uh, Star Wars. Again, the kind of composition that it has, the kind of area that it covers, it's a mid-long shot cut just below the knee. Now, we'll talk about the next uh, shot size, which is the mid-shot. Now, the mid shot is also known as a waist shot. It is known as that because uh, this kind of a composition frames the human figure from the head to just below the waist. Now, again, we have moved again much more closer to the uh, character. What does it do? It shows you more detail. It brings you more detail than what you saw in the, in the mid long shot. So, now the facial expressions start to become clearer. You start, you start concentrating more on the person rather than on the person and the surroundings. So, you have lesser of the surroundings visible. The character itself takes prominence in this kind of a composition. Again, this shot can be both an exterior shot or an interior shot. Now, when I say exterior shot, exterior shot would mean a shot that has been shot outside, you know, uh, 
outside the limits of four walls. Interior shot would mean something like this right now, where you know a person is sitting or standing or whatever action is taking place inside a inside the four walls. So that's an interior shot. Now let's look at examples for mid shot. This, as I said, from uh, the good, the bad, the ugly. Then you have another example from the force awakens. This is just to give you an, this is just to give you an idea as to what the mid shot looks like. So, you are closer, you can see the expressions much more clearly. Next, we have the mid close up or the, or, uh, the MCU. It is also known as a bust shot. Now, again, we are moving in closer to the character. Details about the surroundings are being lost again. Now, this is one of the shots that you will find most used in cinema and, of course, in television. Because this is the kind of composition, this is the kind of uh, shot size that is very natural to a human being. So, imagine if you are talking to a friend. So, whatever area you, uh, whatever area you are looking at or whatever uh, uh, figure of the friend or person you are looking at is visible to you, exactly that composition in a cinema, in a cinematic frame is known as a mid close up. Now, what it does is that it frames the human uh, figure from head to just uh, to between the shoulders and anywhere between the belt line. So, you have your waist and the shoulders. So, anywhere from your head to anywhere between these two places, this kind of a composition is known as your mid close up. It is good for conversations between two characters when you show, want to show interaction, when you want to show ex expressions or reactions from the other person, this kind of a composition is used. And in this situation, you will realize that the surroundings are, are becoming more and more drowned out. Again, this can be both an exterior shot or an interior shot depending on how it has been shot. Let us look at examples. So, this is an example of a mid, uh, of a mid close up. Surroundings are now, are now drowning out. The character is becoming more and more uh, central, not just in terms of framing, but central in terms of the kind of attention that he or she gets. The next shot size is the CU or the close up, also known as the head shot. Why the head shot? Because uh, for a character, it covers, it, it basically uh, just shows the head of the person, the face of the person. Therefore, this particular shot size is also known as a close up. Now, the close up is used to create intimacy intimacy between the audience and the character and also if there are two characters, the kind of intimacy that two characters would have. So, what happens is that whenever you have a close up, it evokes a very strong response, a very strong emotional response from the audiences. Now, uh, as an audience again, they might not realize, but when you have close ups, you will, you will realize that there is some kind of a response that you have, right. So, that is the purpose of a close up. Uh, it brings the entire focus of the frame on the character's face. So, there is nothing uh, visible, there is hardly any background visible and therefore, you are fully concentrated only on the person's face. Again, this shot can be both an exterior shot or an interior shot. Let us look at examples of the close up. So, again uh, an example from the good, the bad, the ugly, a close up you can see just the person, no background at all, entire concentration on the face. Similarly, this example is from uh, the star, uh, star Wars The Force Awakens and again the focus is completely on the face and it does evoke some kind of an emotional response from you because you know what the character is feeling. Now, let us move on to the last uh, shot size which is the extreme close up. Uh, ECU or XCU it is known as, uh, it is the extreme close up. Now, extreme close up is the kind of shot that is used very sparingly. Now, when I say sparingly, Imagine if you are talking to a person who is this close to you, you will obviously feel uncomfortable, right? Uh, that is the exact uh, thing that you do with the extreme close up shot in a, in a film also. You never have a film with a lot of extreme close ups. It is reserved for very dramatic uh, effects to bring into your film. So, what do extreme close ups do? Extreme close ups can focus on very specific things. So, in the case of the face, they can focus just on the eyes or just on the mouth. And they can also focus on uh, inanimate objects. So, such as if you could imagine just a focus of just a cl uh, extreme close up of just this mouse or my hand as they are moving. So, all these examples are uh, all these short sizes are known as your extreme close ups. Uh, what do they do? Uh, close ups can also be used to build suspense or to create tension or to uh, bring some kind of uh, or to bring some sense of apprehension into the audiences. So, they are a wonderful tool to do that. Uh, which is why, as I said, they should be used sparingly and not throughout the entire film. Again, these are the kind of shots that can be both 
uh, exterior as well as interior shots. Now, let us look at the examples of the extreme close up. Um, again, example from the good, the bad, the ugly, the complete focus is only on the eye. You will not look anywhere else. And the piercing gaze, you know, of course, with relation to, with context to the film, it does talk to you, it does say something to you. Uh, when you watch the film, you will be able to understand better. Uh, this example again is, the, uh, is an example from uh, the Star Wars Force Awakens, an extreme close up of just the eye. Now, although I have just shown you examples of the eyes, the as I said, the extreme close up can be of any object, can be of any other part also, that has to be brought into special attention uh, as the director desires as per the story. Now, finally, we will be talking about the concept of visual universe. Now, what is this visual universe? It basically involves the creation of a visual world for the characters of a film that they inhabit. So, to make this clearer, I have uh, I have a clip uh, to show it to you after we after we talk about this. But to make this clearer, imagine films that are set in worlds that you are not aware of. So, uh, right now we were looking at screenshots of the Star Wars. So, Star Wars is the kind of situation that would not that has not existed in real life, right? So, people have to, the director has to create a visual world for it, which is why all the, uh, uh, everything that you see in that particular uh, film is used to create that visual universe. So, it will include your costume, the setting, the place, everything that you see on screen to create the visual universe of the film, the universe in which the characters of the film reside. Now, it helps the audience to perceive the story, to, un to un orient themselves as to what the story is all about or where it is based. Uh, it helps the, the, once they have an understanding of the setting, the audience can also understand um, uh, what the characters are and what their motivations might be. So, now every film has a very definite and identifiable universe in which they exist. So, every film will have a very specific universe. Now, this universe can also be defined by time, that universe can also be defined by space, that universe of course will be defined by all the, by all the visual elements that you see in it. So, the locations, the sets, the wardrobes, they all are part of the visual universe and all of this is caught through cinematography. So, as a cinematographer, as a director, you will decide what all is going into the frame. Now, all these elements, they work together and they are interrelated that create the final look of the film. Now, let us have a, let us have a look at a clip uh, that is, that is going to talk to you about what usual universe is. The clip that you just uh, saw was from the film The Blade Runner and it is one of the establishing shots of the film or the establishing uh, montages of the film. Now, what it does is that it sort of orients you uh, towards what the film, what kind of a place or what kind of a universe the film is based in. So, you see all these high rise, sort of high rise buildings, you see a lot of smoke, a lot of uh, you know sm uh, fire, you also see these uh, uh, these flying machines that look like, that do not look like what you have seen. So, it automatically orients you towards thinking that probably this film is based in the future. So, this is, this is what we mean by visual universe. You look at the film and instantly you understand what the film is all about or you get an understanding of what the film is going to be all about. Now, so this has been the lecture so far. I will now quickly tell you what all we have dealt about today uh, in this particular lecture. So, we talked about uh, the visual language of cinema, concentrating on the construction of meaning purely through visuals. We looked at the kind of vocabulary that is available to a filmmaker and the kind of grammar and syntax of cinema uh, that is put to use. We understood what cinematography entails and also the kind of importance it holds in the, uh, in the film world. Uh, most importantly, we also talked about the five C's of cinematography as described by Joseph Meskelly. And finally, we got a little idea about what, what the term visual universe is and how it is created and what it does for a film. In the next lesson, we are going to talk a little more about the visual language of cinema. So, we will be discussing uh, mise en scène, which is a French term. Uh, I am sure you will be intrigued and want to come back for the next lecture. It is a very important terminology as well as a production tool. We will also talk about the different cinematography tools that are available to the director uh, and how they are used to convey meaning in any filmic text. So, I hope you have enjoyed this lesson today. I will see you the next time.